All right, well, welcome everybody. I'm uh, Andrew Baptist, and I've been with Cockroach Labs about 18 months. You might be wondering about the name if you don't know about us, but basically we build a uh, large scale, very resilient database. And I'll talk a little bit about um, how it works and how you can build uh, mission critical applications using it. Um, I've been working in distributed systems for about 17 years now, so I've worked on very various other large-scale uh, distributed systems and came to Cockroach just because I think they have some of the coolest technology. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, how we got here. Um, I, want, I really want to talk about like how did we get to databases as they exist today um, and where databases are going in the future. Um, a lot of databases are making progress towards um, where Cockroach is today. Um, but I think there's, a, there's um, a, a lot to understand about where databases are. So databases um, are some of the oldest application systems um, in software. The first databases were systems like Ingress and SystemR in the 60s. Um, you probably haven't heard of those systems, but they were kind of replaced in the next 10 years by some of the biggest um, companies, IBM, Oracle, Microsoft, all started building very large-scale databases in the 70s and 80s. Um, and they were all this notion of single node um, databases. So you started with essentially a database, and to make it bigger, you added more and more hardware to this database, more cores, more memory, more disks. And to get the consistency models that they needed, they would build them this way. And this is the way that databases worked for a long time. Um, people realized this was a problem, and then, and then it kind of in the 2000s, um, a lot of these NoSQL databases came along, systems like Mongo, systems like DynamoDB, Cassandra, and they basically said, you can't scale a single node system this way. You can't get the resiliency, you can't get the scale this way. Um, and they said, maybe we need to teach application developers a new way to code. We're gonna give them a worse interface, um, but we're gonna make it very scalable. And these databases came along and did this. There, there were a number of NoSQL databases in the you know, 2000 to 2010 that said this is the way to do it. Um, and this was good for some applications, but it was actually terrible for developers. Developers running against this, um, what, it, it didn't give them the interface they wanted. And um, what happened instead is you saw um, companies like Amazon, like Google, like Microsoft saying, hey, we can take your single node database and we can make it easier to manage, um, we can make it, you know, we, can, we have all the scale-up technology, we have good networks, we can make it more available, we can give you failover. Um, this is actually um, what, uh, you know, the, the, all, all the companies did. You have like uh, Amazon RDS, you have uh, Postgres, you have Azure, and they all did this and they basically said, we'll take our single node database and we'll make it um, really easy to manage and somewhat larger scale, but really single write, writer to this database. And if you want to do things, you can do some manual sharding, that kind of thing. It wasn't, again, really what developers wanted. What they really wanted was you know, the interface that a single node database gave them, but they wanted it at large scale, high resiliency. And so that is what Cockroach gives you. So Cockroach gives you a uh, essentially very large scale, distributed SQL database. Um, it can be distributed across around the world. Um, it handles transactions using serializable consistency. Um, and it, it's, just, it's just what developers wanted. It's, it's basically the next step in this evolution. Um, and again, I think we, we started, um, Google actually started some of this ideas with Google Spanner. Um, I think a lot of the other uh, and I think everybody's going towards this. Cockroach is, is kind of ahead here, though. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what, um, who, who would use a dis system like this. Um, Cockroach is really, our ideal customer are people who um, have mission critical requirements. And what does a mission critical requirement mean? It means that if your system was to go down for an hour, you'd be on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. Right? That, that's the type of customers that are ideal for us. This is, this is really what we're looking for. Um, people who have large-scale systems, people who have systems that a minute of downtime or even 10 seconds of downtime starts costing them millions of dollars. Um, and 
in, or, in, in addition to that, they really want the consistency, the you know, serializable consistency, which I'll talk about a little later, is, is really something that developers want. And the data should really feel like it's local. People don't want to run applications where they're, even though it's a global database, you don't want to be having hundreds of milliseconds latency because it just doesn't make happy end users. Um, so I'll talk about all four of these. Um, and I'll talk about how, um, you know, if you're really building an application that needs these requirements, there really isn't a good solution other than Cockroach Database. Um, so what is Cockroach Database? Like, how is it architected? It really is a distributed SQL layer, um, a shared nothing distributed SQL layer sitting on top of a distributed key value store. Um, they run in the same process, but really you can think of them as two separate things. Um, the distributed SQL layer runs across nodes that can be you know, all over uh, region or uh, over, over the world, um, and the key value store is the same thing. Um, it is a Postgres compatible SQL layer. We don't use any Postgres code. It's, it's a from scratch rewrite. Um, but it does have Postgres compatibility, and that means that you can use your you know, out-of-the-box Postgres drivers. Um, if you're using Postgres, you can just you know, migrate easily over. If you're using a different database, it'd be a similar conversion to migrating to a Postgres system. Um, and the key value store is really what's providing all the resilience. It's providing all the consistency and scalability. Um, so I'm just going to kind of walk through at a high level, like how a query runs through our system. Um, this is very high level, and I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about this, but I just kind of, I think it helps kind of ground people in terms of how this all works. So uh, let's say a query comes in, people run a query that says, I want to get um, data from this table. Uh, it goes into the SQL layer. And the SQL layer, it's not shown here, but the SQL layer um, can also distribute the query to other SQL um, layer nodes. So the query can get um, sharded. Um, it, depending on what the, the query is and the plan and everything else, we can shard the query. It then goes into the uh, KV layer. Um, in the KV layer, um, it turns into reads and writes of keys and values or ranges of keys and values. So typically, they're you know in single key puts and gets. Um, but we do have the transactional guarantees, so multiple keys and values can all be um, updated together. Um, and again, we, we do provide serializable consistency. We've had kind of Jepson testing, and this is all uh, provided. Um, the uh, way this all is routed and, and, and handled and everything else I'll talk about and how, how we uh, manage all this. So let's talk about um, scalability. Like I said, this is one of the uh, kind of two core things that um, Cockroach Labs was built on, scalability and resilience. Um, but scalability um, is, is one of the most important things. And, and a lot of times people don't know when you build your application how big it's going to be. You don't know if you're going to be you know, the next Netflix or the next DoorDash or, um, and you don't want to architect an application um, thinking, uh, I have to re-architect this in two years if I'm really successful. Because that's the worst time to do it, right? When your application is really hot, <laughs> that's the worst time to be thinking, OK, I need to go back and change my database. I, I can no longer use you know, Oracle because it doesn't scale to the systems I need. I, don't, I, I have to rethink and do all this over, because this is the time when you're worried about other things, right? This is, this is when you're worried about you know, like expanding globally. You're doing all these other things. And so your, your scaling should be automatic. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be thinking about this at the time when you're kind of uh, facing the crisis. It should be minimal effort, and it should be affordable, right? It shouldn't be that you have to buy an enormous system to start because you might scale. You should be able to buy what you need and grow to what you need, because uh, you just don't know on day one where you're going to go. Um, so how does it work under the cover? So we have this notion of taking a monolithic, monolithic key space. Um, for this, for this uh, presentation, I'm going to talk about just a simple database of dogs. And I'm showing the keys here, but you can imagine there's values associated with these. Um, so the keys and values here are just kind of the keys of the dog names. Um, as you can see, they're sorted. And then there's values associated with them. Um, I'm ignoring the values for now. Um, if you had multiple tables, um, it would all fit in one monolithic key space. So, so internally, your entire cluster is one sorted key space of everything in the cluster. Um, and uh, it's a multi-version concurrency control, um, as you know, other systems like Postgres are as well. Um, this means that when you update a value, we write the new value, and there's a later a process that comes along and garbage collects the value. And um, we have transactions that span keys. So you can write a 
you can write a transaction that says, I want to update these two rows simultaneously, atomically, all the ACID characteristics that you'd want of a serializable database. Um, so we take that key space and we break it into ranges. Um, now these ranges are initially when you start out, there's only one big range for your key space. Um, but as the data is coming into your system and it grows, we start dividing things. This is all done dynamically. Um, and it, it's across the sorted list of names. So we'll say that you know the first four names will stick in one key space, the next four in the next key space, something like that. Um, and we, we choose a range size of 512 megs by default. This can be adjusted up and down. It's something that's small enough where we can move this data around quickly between nodes, but it's also large enough that we don't have a lot of overhead. And like I said, this all happens all automatically. Um, you're not predefining key split points. You're not defining anything like that. You start with one range, and it just splits as you, as you start writing data. And all the splitting and merging happens automatically behind the scenes. You don't have to worry about, oh, I'm going to schedule uh, you know, you know, a maintenance window at some point to, to, to scale my, uh, to split and merge things. It just all happens as the data is coming into the system and growing. Um, so the ranges themselves are really kind of the basic unit of our system. Each, um, each range is a raft consensus group. If you're familiar with raft, what it essentially, um, or if you're not familiar with raft, what it essentially does is it says, uh, I'm going to create this single log for um, this range, and it has a state associated with it that is getting updated by it. So every time writes come in, they get serialized into this log. Everything gets kind of sequence number in there. And, and ranges are, are kind of basic. Um, starting building block of everything in the system. Everything is a range. This is the only basically persistent data in our system. Um, the raft group um, is distributed across nodes. Um, each raft group can be distributed across a different set of nodes. Um, and each of the ranges, again, um, like I showed on the previous slide, each of these um, three ranges that you see there is its own separate raft group um, that's distributed out. Um, each raft group has a leader. At any point in time, there is a leader of a raft group. The leader is the one that all reads and writes go through. Um, and every write is accepted when a quorum of the cluster says, I've accepted the write. Um, Raft also has a notion of what's called a leaseholder. And at any point in time, so, so a leader is, uh, you could think of a leader as a point in time type of concept. A leaseholder is a now and a, a small time into the future. And the reason we do leaseholders is it, um, it's, it's typically also the leader, but, but there are you know, short periods where it might not be. But the, the leaseholder has some benefits. It allows um, local reads, because since I know I'm the leaseholder, I know that all the rights in the past and up to now have come through me, so I can do local reads. It's also managing some of the transactional semantics of the range. It's managing locking. Um, and this is all done without atomic clocks. So we, do, you know, we, we uh, as I'll talk about later, we, we deploy in multiple different kind of modalities. The, we don't need any specialized hardware. This runs on just any commodity hardware. Um, um, and uh, the way this works is we have this notion of an uncertainty window. I'm not going to get too deep into the details of this. But what it, it means is that we don't do any waiting or anything like that. We don't have to block rights. But um, we do basically guarantee that. Only, you know, again, the, the, the details of how this gets to serializable consistency are a little complicated, and I'm not going to get into that. But we are, we do have a ton of uh, papers published on this, and you know, you can you can read up about somehow this is done. It's it's actually one of the most interesting points about how cockroach uh, database works. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how you add a node to the system. So um, what you see in this picture is uh, four nodes, and there's a new node that's coming online, and the four nodes each have a bunch of replicas on there. And as you'll see for each of the you know, four replicas I had on the previous page, they're on kind of three random different nodes. And now this new node came onto the system. Um, and, and all you had to do, and I'll show you a demo in a second, um, is add the node. And um, it appears. It starts serving SQL traffic immediately. Um, but it doesn't have any replicas on it. It doesn't have any ranges on there. The other nodes will see this. And they'll start transferring data over to it. So. Um, the movement kind of gets decomposed into copy the data over from an existing range. And then once that's done, I can delete my existing range. And again, this is all happening automatically. You don't have to think about anything else. You just add the node to the system, and data is moved around automatically. Um, the, eventually, um, the system gets equalized, where we have an equal number of replicas on each system. And typically, the number is like somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 replicas on each of these nodes. So it's not a huge number. It's not a small number either. Um, 
And we use a lot of different signals to figure out. There's a lot of heuristics to figure out what is the right replica to move when. So we might say, uh, give me, you know, we, we want to balance across all these different things, the disk utilization, CPU utilization, the health of the storage layer underneath, um, the number of requests per second. We also want to avoid kind of any thundering herd problems. So there's a lot of heuristics and kind of, you know, optimizations in terms of doing this well. Um, but generally, within you know seconds to minutes, we start kind of balancing this out, and then the, the, the cluster is all kind of balanced out. Um, and removing a node is just this process in reverse. So if we want to remove a node from the cluster, we just uh, mark this node um, as decommissioned. Um, and decommissioned nodes basically mean that I'm going to you know stop all traffic. You can you can drain a node, which just says I want to stop use this node for traffic, um, and it takes the SQL traffic off and it takes the leases off. Um, but it doesn't take the replicas off. If you're decommissioning node, it does you know, all three of the, the, the first steps. So it removes all the SQL traffic from it, you know, it gets taken out of the load balancing pool, removes all the leases, and then removes all the replicas. Um, so I'm going to show you a demo now of uh, basically how this all works. And uh, you know, it, it's, uh, this is all a live demo. I just recorded this all yesterday morning. I was going to do it live, but I decided it would be a little safer to run this. Um, yeah, a question? Yeah, so, so while you're rebalancing the replicas, um, because again, there's, there's three copies of all replicas, what, what we actually do is we enter in Raft, it's something called a joint config. And what a joint config means is that there's actually two different Raft groups that are running simultaneously. So one with the existing nodes and one with the new set of nodes. And all writes now go to both of those sets simultaneously. And once we have fully gotten the new node up to speed, it's part of the Raft group, but, you know, a, a full node, then we go back and we can destroy the old um, one. And, and again, that's just a metadata operation to say that, that the old ref group doesn't exist. Once that's done, then we garbage collect the... Uh, uh, yeah, but I mean, the, the swap is, is like less than a millisecond type of time. Um, so, um, and because, because of the fact that the leaseholder doesn't typically change during this, um, it's, it's even less than that. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very small just kind of in-memory operation that needs to happen. It's just, just one write to the, to the system. Um, so let me uh, run a demo that shows how this works. Um, I recorded this beforehand. And um, what you see on the bottom left here is uh, latency of the system. So it's running about two milliseconds. Um, th this is a smallish cluster. I think I'm running like 10,000 operations per second through here. Um, on the bottom, you see uh, the kind of two milliseconds. And I'm going to take one of those nodes, and I'm going to stop the node. So I stop the node with a SIG15, um, which is just a SIG term. We send a SIG term to the node. And uh, what you see is it starts draining um, immediately. So that's moving all the leases and stuff off of this node. Um, the other, uh, in, the, in the UI, you also see that there's you know, one node draining. Uh, now it moved to suspect because the node fully stopped. Um, we see that a, a number of replicas are now under-replicated, right? Because those replicas were still on the node. I didn't decommission the node. I just drained the node. And those are um, under-replicated. Um, and uh, now I'm going to put a new version on there. Right? So I want to upgrade the version of the software. The node, I took the node down. Um, and and if, you, if you watch the uh, latency graph on the bottom, you don't see any change with any of this happening, even though I'm running my, all my operations through this. Um, I put a new version of the software on here. Um, I uh, start the node back up. All I had to do was copy the binary over. I start the node back up. And um, you know the 70 replicas that were on there are now under-replicated. But as soon as I uh, start this uh, node back up, They'll, they'll come back to full health. The other nodes will accept it back into the cluster. It'll start getting leases again. It will start serving traffic again. And um, you know, from an end user's perspective, uh, it was just completely seamless. There, there was no, they, they never even knew this happened. Um, so uh, this is really nice from that perspective. But let's say you want to grow your cluster. You say, oh, I'm not able to handle this load. Um, I think my latencies are too high. I want to grow to a new region. All I need to do is, is add new nodes to this cluster. So this cluster is running on Amazon. It's running against three availability zones in a region. Um, but let's just add three more nodes to the cluster. Um, and again, this is all kind of real time. This is not like sped up or anything else. This is just how the system would work for you as an end user. So I start uh, three more nodes in my cluster. I would pre-staged them on there. Um, but you know, they're brand new nodes to this cluster. They get accepted to the cluster. And now I have 12 nodes in my cluster. Um, and uh, initially, there's zero replicas on those nodes. But the other nodes notice that this node, these nodes are here. They're missing data. 
and uh, they start um, transferring data to it. Now here you actually do see the latency did go up a tiny bit. It was at like two milliseconds, and now it's at three milliseconds. Uh, we have a bunch of throttles in there where you know you can you can adjust that. Um, but with adding three nodes to the system, you know it, it went up a tiny bit. But uh, as soon as that's done and you know the, the nodes are done, it's it's kind of fully healthy. And again, like I said, in, in a normal cluster you can adjust that so that doesn't happen either. Um, so so this is uh, basically how you know simple it is to scale, add, remove change these configurations. You don't have to think at all about any of the things that are happening be behind the scenes. Um, all right, I'm gonna move on to the next thing, which is resilience to failure. So I showed the kind of the sunny day scenario. So I took, I took a cluster that was running, and I added uh, nodes, I, I, I shut down nodes cleanly. But now let's, do, um, let's talk about what happens uh, when there's a problem. So uh, first of all, why does this even matter? Again, I talked about <laughs> Who are our ideal customers? These are the ones where failure is just not an option, where if, if the node goes down for 10 seconds, um, you're getting phone, you know, <laughs> you're, you're, uh, getting, uh, you're losing millions of dollars in some cases with some of our customers, right? So um, a lot of customers, I mean, you know, and I'm not gonna go through all these statistics, but they're pretty sobering. If you think about a, a company where their application is the business, um, it's a real problem if your database goes down. This is the one part of your system that's really hard um, to, 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 to work around um, this failing. And, you know, I, I, I pulled these, I think this was from some, some Splunk report that they had done like last year, um, but, but these are kind of statistics of what companies, who are our ideal customers, really are seeing when there's failures. It's just kind of game over. I mean, companies go out of business with, with a, you know, with a one day failure. Like, if you think about customers, like companies like a DoorDash or something like that, if you can imagine them being down for a day, they may not be a company anymore. Um, and so resilience to failure is really important. Um, and uh, let's, let's talk about what happens, right? So um, let's say that you're running this cluster and all of a sudden a node just disappears. It drops off the network. You have no idea why. It could be that the operating system crashed. It could be that the hardware crashed. It could be that somebody accidentally tripped on the power cord. Um, but they all look the same, right? This, this cluster is now, uh, this node is no longer talking to the cluster. It's not heart beating anymore. And um, what, what happens in this case, right? So there were queries in, in flight to this node. Um, there were leases, there were replicas all on this node, and this, this node crashes. So if the node disappears and we don't know if it's gonna come back or not, you know, we, we kind of first classify it as a temporary failure. We say, you know, we're gonna hope this node comes back. Um, but immediately the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna move leases off of that node. All the leases that were on there, they're gonna expire in about three seconds, and they move to other nodes um, in the cluster. This, again, is all happening automatically. Within about three seconds, your cluster is restored to health, and it's running without that node in there. Um, so after the node kind of disappears, um, it, it, it um, is down, the cluster is fully healthy, and again, I'll show you another demo of this in a second, um, but um, while it's down, the, the node fall behind. If the node comes back up, if, if this gets re restored, like um, uh, maybe somebody did plug it back in because they <laughs> accidentally unplugged their node, um, we're gonna catch back up that node that went down. So the replicas it had on there probably fell behind. They missed some of the RAF entries. Uh, we'll update those RAF entries. That'll all, all automatically happen. Um, if it fell too far behind, um, we might give it a snapshot instead. A snapshot just says, here's the entire 512 megs for your range. Uh, just use that instead. And we'll, we'll basically catch it up. And it catches up quickly and it, it becomes healthy again within typically seconds. Um, and, uh, but, but I mean, we kind of have two mechanisms to catch it back up. If it's a permanent failure, on the other hand, after about five minutes, we give up on this node. We say, I don't think this node's gonna come back. Um, you know, we, we don't know why it failed. I don't know if it's gonna come back. We're gonna kind of give up on it. And what we do in that case is we start transferring the replicas off. Transferring the replicas off can take a little bit longer. Um, because there's a, a lot of data, you know, maybe we're talking about several terabytes of data that we gotta move off, they're gonna move. Um, the leaseholders will automatically detect that they're the, the, the under-replicated ranges as you saw before, and they're just gonna move things around after about five minutes. Um, and it's gonna just create new replicas, it's gonna bring all the replicas that we had back up to full health within, you know, again, I, on the order of an hour typically, it's, it, it's fully healthy again, that, that all the replicas have been recreated and it's, it's fully, um, fully caught up. So um, I'm gonna show you another demo of you know, kind of how this works as well. Um, and, and, and just uh, before I talk about this, the resilience is not just at the node level. So I, I mentioned kind of how it looks at a node level. 
but it's really, um, you could think about this being at an AZ level, right? Maybe an AZ had an outage, or maybe an entire region had an outage, or maybe the entire cloud went down. You know, maybe AWS went down for an hour, and you have a multi-cloud um, deployment. Um, it can, it can uh, handle all those failures, right? Because some of these customers, that the customers that we're talking to are sometimes not able to live with the availability that a, cloud, a single cloud can provide them. They want higher availability than that. Um, so let's um, run another demo. Um, uh, bef sorry, one last quote before I do that. Uh, this, this was just a quote from one of our customers. Um, they've literally been unable to kill this thing no matter what, what we've thrown at it. Uh, this, is, this is the kind of, uh, you know, this is the experience we want for all of our customers in the sense that they are basically, this is the last thing they need to worry about is their system, right? They want their database to just run and they want to worry about all the rest of their uh, application. So here's another demo. And in this case, what I'm going to do, rather than stopping the node with a SIG term, I'm going to stop it with a uh, uh, SIG kill. Um, uh, you know, it basically just kills the process immediately. And here on the latency on the bottom, you'll actually will see a blip. So I'm showing the P99 latency. Um, at a P50 latency, you actually wouldn't see this blip. But at a P99 latency, for about three seconds there, you see errors. Right? So there's a small pause, you know, and, and there's errors for about three seconds. Um, and again, the, there's under-replicated ranges here, um, but all the leases got transferred in about three seconds. Um, the cluster is, uh, um, you know, still running fine, and, and, and as soon as that's it detected, um, it, it's, uh, it's uh, healthy again. So rather than just killing one node, um, what if I were to kill an entire AZ? So um, I'll go kill uh, the one CAZ. So this is simulating that, that entire AZ goes offline. I'm um, running my cluster again. It's fully healthy now. And now um, I'm killing nodes seven through nine. So if I kill three random nodes, I could break, um, you know, quorum, that kind of thing. But if I kill three nodes within an, within an AZ, our system's smart enough with placement that it's going to place things in a way where um, the replicas, you know, the, the raft groups will always span AZs here. So, so I have my, you know, four AZs. There won't be any raft group that would only be in you know, have two replicas in one AZ. Um, it would always be spanning the AZs. And so in here, I was able to kill that node. Um, again, I see a small outage, um, but then the cluster is healthy again, and I can uh, restart that node up, and uh, it, it's all healthy. So, so this is kind of the experience that our customers are looking for, that, you know, maybe they're seeing two or three seconds of outage when, uh, when an AZ goes down. Um, in their system, and that's when it goes down unplanned. If it was a planned thing, as you saw previously, you wouldn't see any outage at all. Um, all right, let's talk next about uh, data feeling local. So um, this is great that you have your data distributed across different, you know, AZs and regions and clouds and everything else. But you might be wondering, well, what does the latency look like in this case? How, how are you guaranteeing like, that my system runs well when I have my data all over the world? And uh, you know, in some sense, the speed of light is too slow. If you're, if you're running from uh, New York to Australia, if you were to shine a flashlight and you know, hold a mirror up, it would take 100 milliseconds. That's kind of at the boundary of what people find acceptable. And for a database, that's really not acceptable. People are looking for you know, sub 10 millisecond latencies on these systems. Um, so you might be thinking, well, how is this possible? How do I guarantee all this consistency and still get latencies that look good for end users? Um, and I'm going to talk about kind of four different patterns that we do um, to get you there. Again, I, in, in a fully generic general state, you can't always guarantee it. But for customers um, that kind of are you know, willing to kind of like build some of this, they can. And, and, and the first two are really just patterns that deal with knowing what your data is and, and how it, um, where your people are accessing it from and how that all works. Um, global tables, um, they're, they're similar to reference tables. Um, and, and basically, you get uh, copies of the table all over the place and low latency reads all the time. And then follower reads is, is something that I'll talk about where you can opt into slightly stale data. So with these four patterns, even though you have a global database that spans the globe, right, you're, you're still able to get latencies that feel like users are accessing your data locally. Um, so, uh, one other reason that you might care about locality, in addition to the performance, is also um, there, there's uh, 
you know, there's restrictions from compliance reasons, right? So you might be in, in Europe and there's a regulation that says you have to keep data in Europe. Um, so we kind of have this notion of you can create like regions, you can create actually super regions, right? So we, we automatically place data, as you saw before, where we, we kind of avoid failure zones. Um, so we try and distribute your data as much as we can, but then within the constraints you give it. So if you say that I have a global um, database, but I want to keep all my data in Europe, or maybe I want to keep it all in this one AZ or one region or whatever else. You can do that. You can constrain it. But if you don't constrain it, we'll spread it out, right? So you, you kind of have this ability to do this. And it's not just on a database level. You can do this on a table level. Um, you can do this um, on indexes, other things like that. You can, you can specify it at whatever level you want. Um, a lot of customers will just do it at a kind of a database level. So you say, I want this database to uh, be across you know, the Europe region, and I want it to survive any type of regional failure. Right? And, and, and by setting those things up, it will automatically figure out how to place all your data and do things automatically for you. Um, and this is possible to do manually. It's really hard to get right manually. And you typically don't notice you did it wrong until it actually one of the, <laughs> something goes down and, and it fails. But, but with you know, Cockroach Database, this just happens automatically. Um, so this is kind of one approach that you can do. Um, but this is, this is kind of the simple one. I'm going to talk about the other ones, which are a little bit uh, more unique to Cockroach. So the next one is something called regional by row data. And what regional by row data is, is you, um, you specify that this data has some notion of locality to it. And we will now take your data and add to your primary key of all the tables that this applies to. We'll add um, a prefix, which is the region that this data should be in. And by doing that, um, when we, we, we now separate the data into different kind of shards. You can think of these as different shards. And each shard is tied to a region. So rather than having, um, rather than having one you know, monolithic key space as we had before, essentially you kind of get these regional. It's, it still falls within the same key space, but the prefix of your primary key on all these tables and indexes is now the region. And what we can do with that is now you can constrain how each of those regional ones work. So you can say, I want my R1 region to be in the US. I want my R2 to be in Europe, that kind of thing. And um, you know, an example where this is really useful is if you think about you know, your, your user table, your customer table. And essentially, your users do have a locality that they run in, right? So typically, you have a user who lives in the US, and they're going to access it in, in the US. Um, they may travel to Europe, and they may access it there, but they're usually going to be in the US, and they want to have the best latency when they're in the US. Um, and so by prefixing all your tables this way, um, we automatically will move all, you can now constrain and say, OK, I want that data to live across regions in the US only. And you get the nice latency for that. But from an application, Use, from like an application developer's perspective, they're not thinking about this at all. All they're thinking about is, um, you know, I just have a table, and to me it looks like a global table, and I just read and write data to it. So I don't have to, I don't have to think about, oh, if he moves regions, I need to delete him from this table and add him here, nothing like that. It's just, you know, it just happens all automatically, simply by adding this kind of region prefix to things. So we get low latency reads, um, as long as you're reading from the region that it's kind of tied to. Um, and writes, because of the way we do writes, we actually complete writes in a single round trip typically. So um, you, you kind of have this notion of kind of getting the best of both worlds with these types of tables. Um, and I'm going to talk about global tables, which again are our reference tables. And um, <laughs> as, as I mentioned before, we're a, a serializable database, right? Which, which serializable databases mean that you have to be able to kind of assume that you can order every single transaction that happened in the database and run it in order. And how do you do that on a, on a reference global table and still get low latency for reads? Um, well, the way that you do that, it may seem impossible, but the way that you do this is you actually write into the future. So what you do is you say, I'm not writing now. I'm writing one second into the future. And one second's long enough for that write to propagate around the globe. And then you come back. So it's, it, it's making a trade-off here between um, a person who needs to have um, fast reads everywhere Right? I want low latency reads from anywhere in the world, and I want serializable consistency writes. Well, the way we do that is we delay writes until we know that they've made it all over the world. We set a timestamp on the write, which is in the future, and we don't commit that write until you know, that time has passed. So the write might take a second to write. So if you're going to update this, you might see a second. But these are reference tables. They're typically you know, replicated everywhere. They're typically small, and they don't get updated that frequently. So you're OK taking a hit on the writes. 
and then you guarantee local reads everywhere. And again, there's, there's a lot of data here. This is actually all a, a picture I just took from our blog post, which uh, you know, if you're, you're interested in some of this stuff, the, we have some really good articles. Um, but, but generally, the idea is that we write a timestamp in the future, and it means that all our reads can be serializable and fast. So you never, you never have to read across regions um, to do this. Um, it's really just kind of another point in this whole complicated multidimensional space between kind of read latency, write latency, kind of linearizability, the failure tolerance, you know, data partitioning, storage costs. Like, there's a lot of complicated um, places, and by your database kind of providing you these options, you can make the right decision for your uh, data. Uh, yeah, question? What about clock skew? Yeah, so that's a good question about clock skew. Like, how do we deal with clock skew? And so what we, um, what we have is something called an uncertainty window as things are writing. Um, and generally what, what it means is how far apart are those clocks? And, and we basically will kick nodes out of the system if their clock gets too out of sync. For most clusters, we set this at about you know, 100, 200 milliseconds, something like that. Um, and if you have multiple transactions um, that are conflicting within the clock skew, they need to block behind one another. If they're not conflicting transactions, they don't need to. Um, this uncertainty interval you see at the bottom here, um, that, that's to deal with the clock skew specifically. So that, that, that's how we deal with clock skew. Um, and, and by adding this uncertainty interval, we kind of uh, guarantee that you're, you're able to um, still provide this strict serializability, you know, even, even in the face of clocks that drift a little bit. Although we are really excited about um, you know, AWS announcing kind of their high precision clocks now, um, because it means that we can turn our uncertainty interval down, and that means that we reduce contention False contention, I guess I would say, right? Where, where, you, where we have to have that contention today. Um, and you know, this isn't necessarily a free lunch, um, but you know, think about the case where you have a user who's sitting in Europe, and you have your application server sitting in the U.S., and you have your database sitting back in Europe. Uh, t if, if this were to happen, you know, when he makes a request, it goes to the application server. Uh, that's you know, 5,500 kilometers. Uh, that makes a request to the database, that sends a response back, and that sends a, uh, you know, the response to the user. If we did this all at light speed, we'd be running at about 100 milliseconds. Um, in practice, uh, this is probably closer to 200, 300 milliseconds because we're running through fiber, other things like that, which is not a great user experience, right? So what you should have done instead in this case is you should have used a regional table. Um, you should have, you know, put your application server distributed around the world, hitting the local tables, and now you get very low latency. You know, now we're talking about five, ten millisecond latency on these types of requests. Um, and you know, if you scale into a new market, you have application servers everywhere. You have, you know, database using these regional tables and global tables and regional by row and all the primitives we give you, and you can get all the nice low latency, and you get uh, users having good experience everywhere. Um, the last uh, thing I'm going to talk about from a mission critical requirement is just how writes need to be right. Um, back in 92, so this was uh, over 30 years ago now, um, and then this, you know, there were some updates from 95. Uh, Jim Gray uh, actually kind of wrote about isolation levels and anomalies. And the way that isolation levels and anomalies are linked is that different isolation levels have different anomalies. And why is this important? It's important because application developers don't know how to code to any application level that's not, any database level that's not serializable. Um, if you ask people what are the anomalies you can get, you know, you'll get some hand wavy responses. They may or may not know what all these different uh, anomalies mean. They don't know when they would apply to them. And they, tr you know, a lot of application developers will try and build kind of workarounds around not having serializable isolation. But it, it's a complicated model. Right? I mean, it's hard enough building an application, but you have to, if you have to think about the, the database is not really doing what you think it's doing at certain times, it's a really hard model, right? And if you have a lot of users all performing critical transactions, you know, that, that you're not, you don't want to lose data, it's, it's really hard um, to do this. And um, basically, we, um, from day one, have supported serializable isolation. Um, we, we run like Jepson, you know, tests all the time that prove that we have this isolation level um, serializable globally. It makes it just an easier model for users to go to. And if you have the option, 
Uh, no one would prefer a weaker isolation model, right? The reason you pick it is because you, you know, either your database doesn't support it, or you're concerned about some of the performance implications, other things like that. Um, one of the nice things we also have is kind of related to this is our schema changes are all serializable as well. They're all part of this. Uh, there's zero downtime. You can make schema changes on the fly. Um, they get serialized along with everything else. Um, and uh, um, again, won't go into the details in this talk, but it's, it, it really means that you can run these zero downtime schema changes. Um, there's no anomalies, and everything just works. That said, uh, we did have requests because people have written applications against Postgres using read committed isolation. And so we are adding a read committed isolation level to our database for customers, at least you know, for a transition period as they're moving over to it. And one of the reasons that people like read committed is that you don't get retries on reads in some cases, for instance. Um, whereas you, you may get that with serializable isolation. Um, all right. That being said, sometimes stale reads are OK. Uh, sometimes um, customers say that, you know, I, I don't need to have the most up-to-date data uh, for this request, right? I, I'd rather have this request um, have some stale data. And if you have a transaction that only does reads, this only applies to you know, fully read-only transactions. If you're doing a transaction that only has reads and you can deal with stale data, um, we, we have something called follower reads. And what this basically means is that you can read from any of the nodes. Um, and we, there's kind of two ways of doing it. And there's actually a really nice benefit of it. The, the exact staleness read um, is really a time travel query. So you can say, give me the data as of you know, either some follower read time stamp, which is a little bit in the past, or you can give it an exact time. So an example here is that, let's say you're a bank, and you want to generate a report at midnight. You don't want to lock the entire database to do that, so you want to be able to run. But now, because we have time travel queries, you can say, give me what everything looked like at midnight. Um, you can't do this way back into the past because we are because we're MVCC GC. We, this is how we support this, but you can only go back until the GC comes along, which normally people have it set as like four hours or twelve hours or something like that. You can set it longer, but you know there's 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 issues with setting that too long. So so normally you know you can run a query as of an exact system time, or you can say something with max staleness. Give me data that's no more than five seconds old, um, and, and it will essentially figure out how to. Uh, how to do that, and that can be more efficient in some cases than having to do uh, exact timestamp read. Um, so this is this is kind of a nice thing. You can create um, what are called just read replicas. You can distribute them around the world if you wanted to. You can do follower reads against that. So you, so we have a lot of ways that you can kind of optimize the system and you know share the load um, as needed. Um, okay. So. Where, where does this all leave you? I mean, really what we're doing is we are pushing the boundary of the CAP theorem. Um, if you're familiar with the CAP theorem, basically it says it's impossible to get all three of these. You can't have a partition tolerant system that's both highly, that's both highly like, like available all the time and is consistent. Um, and it, I mean, this is like a, a mathematical proof. This isn't something that any system can actually um, overcome. However, uh, you know, the, the um, Eric Brewer, who was uh, you know, involved with Spanner and other things like that, said, yeah, this is true in the theoretical sense. Right? In the theoretical sense, you can't have all these things. But in a practical sense, uh, this was a quote from him, you have, to have, you have to hear the tree fall to count it as a problem. Right? So let's say that an AZ goes down, um, and you have application servers in that AZ. Well, sure, those application servers can no longer have availability because that AZ is cut off from the rest of the world. So, so the AZ didn't, didn't go down completely, but it's AZ network connection to the world got cut off. Well the, well, the nodes in that AZ can no longer read and write, but your end users can no longer talk to those nodes either. Right? Those application servers are kind of cut off. And so the fact that those nodes can't read or write anymore doesn't really matter to you. What matters to you is that all the rest of the nodes in your system can read and write. And in practice, for almost all network partitions, um, we are available. Um, I mean, we, we, we have systems that are running, you know, five, six, nines of availability, even though we're a CP system. So you get all the consistency, and you're still running with basically perfect availability. Um, so this is, this is a really interesting way to think about, you know, how your system's running. You don't have to make the trade-offs, right? NoSQL databases will come back to you and say, well, you're going to, you know, if you want consistency, you're giving up availability. Well, in practice, that's not the case. You're really getting consistency and availability from a system like this. Um, and really, this, uh, 
database is built for when the application is the business, right? When, when you're building applications that your entire business depends upon, uh, that, that is uh, when Cockroach Database is, uh, is built. Um, and you know, a different kind of way of looking at this is you get all the benefits of relational databases, you get all the benefits of NoSQL databases, and you get all the benefits of the cloud. Um, I'll show you on the next slide. I mean, you can actually run this in, in various different ways. Um, but you know, the relational databases are great for consistency, but didn't have some of the scale. NoSQL was great for scale, but didn't have all the consistency. And the cloud really kind of makes everything better. So, so you can run this system now, and you kind of get the benefits of everything. This was built from the ground up for the cloud. Um, and uh, finally, when you deploy this system, uh, for the first few years of Cockroach, the only system was the one on the left, which was self-hosted. We sold software and support, and we said, run your own database uh, wherever you want. And we have customers that are running on on-prem. We have customers that are running on AWS, running on different clouds, running cross clouds. Um, but recently, we've added this kind of cloud platform as well. And there's kind of two modes of it. Um, there's a dedicated mode. Um, this is where you have your nodes and only running Cockroach on your nodes. Um, and it's in one of the clouds. Or you can go to serverless, and serverless is a shared cluster. Um, typically, serverless today is mostly for small customers that don't want to you know, have a minimum cluster size. They want to get the resiliency, and they want to have the ability to scale, but they start on serverless. And then you can move to dedicated. You can migrate over to dedicated when you need to. Um, we have over 300 customers today. Um, again, a lot of customers that are running some of their most important applications on our system. Um, this number is only going to grow over time. Um, these are, again, the apps that are powering the world. Uh, we have a lot of other financial institutions, you know, things like casinos here that are running on this. People that are dealing with money where transactional correctness and everything else needs to be correct. It hides all the, the complexity for you. Um, most greenfield applications, this is easiest to do, but because we're Postgres compatible, we have a lot of migrations as well from systems like Oracle or, um, you know, from, from, from other Postgres systems, from cloud systems, other things like that that are coming over and moving towards Cockroach. And uh, just a few resources. We have um, a really good blog. Um, a lot of the slides and data you know, and pictures I grabbed from some of our blog posts. So if you want to read in more detail on any of this, you, know, you should go look at the, the blog. You know, we have our releases. And uh, there's a community Slack channel. Um, all the source code is available. Um, it's not, we're not fully open source, but all the source code is available, so you can see the source code. Uh, there is a core version that you can run as a you know, fully open source version, and then there's kind of proprietary extensions, which are available, but they're not under an open source license. Um, and uh, that's it. Um, thank you.